Hello, how's everybody doing? Buenas tardes. Yeah, we good? It's a little hot up here. Yeah, here's. who's hot? He, who's well, hot? We're cool. I think it's cooler where we're, we're at. Yeah. We're, we're VIP, so <laughs> we appreciate no. you. If you're in the back and you want to come forward, the front row oh, has yeah. a bunch of seats. There's four. There's seats over here. My makeup looks better if you we, come closer. We want to see your faces. We both have beautiful pink lipstick that you would enjoy better <laughs> closer. Um, but yeah, I'm so excited to be here you with you. You can see the Virgen's expression if you're yes, closer. We have she the has an expression. You know, you can see, uh, yeah, everything. So you're more than welcome to come through. Don't look at my fingers. I don't have nails right now. And if you all know me, that's my signature. So I'm that's naked. Your jam. So I'm sorry. But yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to start sharing two poems. And I'm going to start first, and then Vicky will. And um, yeah, are we all ready? Let's do yes, it. okay. So I'm going to read a poem from uh, Corazón, which is what I call my love poem to Los Angeles, and um, because we're talking about uh, the Latinx poetry in LA, right? What I know. One, are the bus routes that take you in and out of downtown Los Angeles. Two, the names of every street between Silver Lake and Echo Park. Three, what each store was before the gentrification. Four, the corner we found my father on after a diabetic shock. Five, the alley where mommy had us walk through the night papi hit her. Six, the clinic where I saw my first therapist at 12. Seven, the parking lot where a drunk papi tried to teach me to drive. Eight, the Rite Aid I got banned from for shoplifting. Nine, the store that doesn't ID for beer. 10, the old zoo. 11, Griffith Park and its secret corners. 12, Glendale and a shopping mall. 13, Santa Monica and my two sisters. 14, Papi's old car parked on our block. 15, my body, a glowing star within it. 16, my first love and his hands around me. 17, the jacaranda tree where I cried him out of me. 18, the dead end where I took my next lover. 19, the condom wrappers by the 101. 20, Fairfax and Melrose. 21, another lover in his car. 22, his hand on my knee down sunset. 23, the apartment in Culver City. 24, the breakup in Westwood. 25, in Hollywood. 26, on Broadway. 27, the hospital in East LA. 28, the two fetuses it kept. 29, California hospital. 30, my father it kept. 31, the grief I left everywhere. 32, what this city takes. 33, what this city gives. 34, what I cannot forget. 35, who I was before I knew what I know now, before these palm trees ever loved me back. Thank you. And my second poem is, yeah. it's... And I'm not texting, I'm just looking for a poem. No, go ahead, Sorry. girl. Even if you want to text, we're good. Sometimes you gotta, well, I don't know, I'm single, so sometimes I gotta arrange the booty call while I hear a, a poem. reminds me like, oh, the condom, the condom wrappers by the 101, that reminds me, you know. But that's my, that's my story. Uh, this is called At My Funeral, from my second book, De Soto. At my funeral, I want you to play Beady Beady Bom Bom, followed by Back That Ass Up, <laughs> followed by Fan Gabriel, followed by anything by Drake. At my funeral, I want you to eat all that you can. Please don't turn down my mother's cooking. She will be grieving and offer you plateful. Say yes to each one. This will make her feel closer to me. At my funeral, don't read any of my poems. I wrote those to stay alive. Let them rest, stretch their limbs, pack their bags, find new fingers at my funeral. Let the men make jokes. I have understood that masculinity only allows them to be tender through laughter, and I want them soft and sweet during my final goodbye. At my funeral, thank the women. My mother, my sisters, my girlfriends kiss their palms, keep their tissues. They are holy, and what I am the saddest about leaving at my funeral let the babies go free. 
kiss their heads, sneak pastries into their chubby hands, watch their faces flush with delight at my funeral, find the little girls and let them play with my lipsticks, especially the red one, each mouth a rosebud made just for me. At my funeral, please do not feel obligated to cry. Remember that this body of mine felt most alive beneath strobe lights and loud music at my funeral. I will be dead, of course, and this will be a victory. Praise the sudden illness or accident that claimed me. Praise the hospital bed I exhaled in. Praise the doctors and nurses and prayers that try to keep me. Praise this heart of mine that couldn't anymore. Praise all the years that came wrapped themselves around my legs and pulled me away, praised my death because it did not come from my own hands or from a razor blade or from a pill. It came because it was time, because my body or my God said, come home, and I collected all that I am and walked through that door at my funeral. Please, play a song that says I survived myself. Praise be such a sweet, Sweet end. Thank you. And now, Vicky. Well, it was really beautiful, and um, and I think we've we've thought a lot about what kind of questions we wanted to ask and what kinds of things we wanted to talk about today. And I've kicked around the idea a lot about uh, resisting that explaining who you are as a person of color, as a queer person, as anything that is uh, seen as other by um, a shrinking majority, that's not how I respond to the world in my work. I write who I am, we write who we are, and so that's, instead of thinking like, oh, this is a panel where I'm gonna learn what Latinx means, or like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, tell me what it means to be you, like, hmm, tell me about that, tell me about your <laughs> sarape life, like, we're not gonna do that, right, so we're, so your reading just reminded me that, that we're writing who we are. Right. And so just, uh, just put it out there. Um, yes. Yeah. Yay. OK. Uh, this poem is from Palm Frond, which I don't have copies of today, but that's OK. And um, who has heard of Maricela Norte? Maricela Norte, yes. Very important Los Angeles writer. Uh, look her up, so Maricela Norte. And um, she is also a, she's a visual artist and a poet and she takes beautiful photographs of, of Los Angeles, and this is after her work. What you see, what you take with you. On the Broadway bus with French diamond lip and composition notebooks, fancy tipped acrylic. Come closer, chula. A chola's dragon eyebrows scowl at the Walmart. Old folks' names fade blue on my chest. Donuts and doctors and stores and more stores. Open and closed, closing, closer. On dusty cakes, re-ride by the saddest office in the world, brown plastic brides and grooms. The bride's gown is yellowed lace, and the wedding cost more than we could pay. T-shirts fade in a storefront, Che Guevara with Mickey Mouse ears. He's a churro VIP. A loteria hoodie smothers a boy waiting for his quinceanera sister to hurry up already. Passing the city college, passing the city college, femur bones are labeled their names on masking. El Santo reads the news in the adjacent seat. He's got a modern tuxedo, worn down blue boots. On Alvarado, Alarma magazine, another shot in the head date, inky blood, white tile, eye level for Dora and Diego. One bakery morning, a reindeer and two chichis tussle at the register. Baby blonde Jesus plays his pan dulce accordion. On a telephone pole, a bedroom is listed for a woman or a señora. You decide. Almost home on the bus, our carriage, El Huracan, that man and his moral, he strolls past the butcher. The rolls through electric yellow, bra straps carve into her shoulders. Los Angeles is a triple X huarache. Sopping wet bambazos. Come closer, chula. There's something I've been meaning to tell you. Thank you. 
there's a lot more poems about Los Angeles and Palm Front. What I ended up doing um, to make that book happen, that was like the fun book in grad school <laughs> because I was writing a memoir and that shit was not fun <laughs> and it was really hard. So I was like, oh, let me write poems, which are like, oh, I can write about my mom, I can write about nopales, it's fine. So for me, like poetry is like the safe thing. Interestingly, I, yeah, um, we can talk about that. But um, so this is from a new collection, which has been really hard. Um, we were talking about the book after your first book and maybe after your second and your third and like, Oy. so George Michael at the Virgin Mega Store. I saw him from a listening station. When I turned toward the descending stairs, there he was head to toe white, a shadowed cheek, his linen billowed, the finer things some of us want. I can't tell what's true from what I have seen. Harmless deception, it keeps things this way. Behind him, an iridescent CD aura or aura, sunlight through the glass, a small saxophone solo started in my ears. It was George, and I didn't ask him to sign anything. I didn't say hello. Who could ask him? What could I ask him? My tapes of his were at home in a box under my bed. My white shorts walked out of the store into the parking lot, which was any city with movie stars. My heart ran fast into my friend's car, ran down Sunset until it became Brooklyn. I kept running until I was ready to look into another kind of light. I am still running. And I run into the jack-in-the-box bathroom. Above me, a pearled fluorescence. Mom and I had just left the doctor, so there must have been hot pink syrup in her purse. As I washed my hands, a light opened the door. It was her, a ma, in white cotton pants and a yellow polo. She said, I can't work any harder than I do, Chata. I don't know what the hell you want from me, which is a wham lyric, by the way. My breath, my breath here is suspended because what can you say to that? I'm sorry, mommy, I don't help you clean more. I'm spoiled. I said that and dried my hands, or maybe I said, I am ma, and I laughed. And if I did, she definitely smacked me in the face. So pretty much what I said was going to show regret or keep it moving. But I didn't run, I could not. Where do you go when you're small? <laughs> Where do you go when you are small and you can't help your mom the way you want to? To pay for jet planes, to escape a cheating viejo, holiday getaways in snowy mountains like George Michael, but I could stay. By her side we walked, definitely glided toward the bus past the wonton warehouses in commerce and green lawns of commerce back to our neighborhood of descending bus stops. We were head to toe fine shadows, another kind of light. Thank you so much. Girl. I broke the seal. No. So now we can cry. <laughs> no. I think, um, Straying away from the first question already, because I knew that we were going to do this. They gave us cue cards. I'm like, uh, hi, <laughs> my name is Jessica, and I don't do anything by any rules. <laughs> so I'm here. But um, I, do you think that being a poet from L.A. and sharing poems, do, do you live your poems differently when you're reading them here? It's cancer season, so I'm like having the most feelings I've ever had in my life. So if you're with me. <laughs> you're welcome. So, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, cancer. Um, uh, it, just depend, it just depends where your heart is. Yeah. Like, how tender are you today? And like, right. as fellow poets, you're like, well, sometimes it's real tender. Sometimes I don't give it enough. Yeah. Because there's children here, right? There's, there's more than one child. I see at least one. Um, I mean, they're going to learn today. Yeah. Okay. Right. So it just depends. <laughs> it just yeah. depends. So, um, Yeah. I mean, for, for me, I, there's some places that are very close to home, you know, like, uh, I'm not going to point him out, well, whatever, Mr. Mr. Aby is here, Steve Aby, my seventh grade poetry club teacher oh is God. here, and um, the, my, 
my first teacher that ever encouraged me, encouraged my poetry in any way. And um, he, at the end of the school year, we did a reading at Skylight Bookstore, um, these middle schoolers. And I remember dreaming of my book one day being in his shelves and doing a reading there. And now I have two books there that I can't ever take pictures of their shelves because every time I go, they're sold out. And um, <laughs> so, okay. so um, today is also a very full circle kind of day. And I didn't expect it. Um, I like this is such a chill, cool event that I was just like, I'm just gonna go be cute. And then Mr. <laughs> Mr. Steve is, I, mean, I can't call you Steve, I keep calling him Mr. Amy, but um, he like showed up and then I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm just gonna cry all day because this yeah. is just so full circle. But yeah, and I think LA is always full of those things like you realize you're in a room where you were once in the audience um, and, and things like that, you know? And, and so hearing your voice crack during your poem, I think made the poem even much more beautiful because especially it's about your mom. Yeah. Yeah. All the, all the feelings, like all the time this month, so. Yeah, yeah. you're welcome. It's, you know, I'm a cancer, so. I'm thriving, I'm like, oh, all the feelings? Swimming. For those of you standing in the back, there's a couple of seats um, dispersed around here, and I'm pretty sure everybody doesn't have cooties, so just come and, and hang out. Oh yeah, where their hands are, or their hands are raised, there's yes. seats. If there's Yay. a seat next to people. We already cried, so if you yeah, just got here, already... just catching you up. <laughs> so. Cool. The, our, our first question is, what defines your, your poetry? What are we saying that needs to be heard? I mean, I think everything I gotta say needs to be heard. <laughs> um, I am a, a, a Salvadoran um, fat woman uh, creating art in a city that uh, tells people that look like me that we don't deserve to be visible. Um, so I feel that me taking up as much space with my voice is important, especially when we are such a part of the like the culture here. Um, you know, we Latinx folks get erased in in general media, and then within the Latinx community, we Salvadorans get erased. We're only popular right now because of the current political climate, and and like I don't want people to know what Salvadoran is just because of the fact that we're refugees. You know. And uh, so I think it's important for me to tell my story so that people understand that there's so much more to us than the Mara Salvatrucha or the concentration camps, you know? And I mean, I call them that because that's what they are. But yeah, so I think that that's why my story is so important. And I mean, yeah, I think everybody's story is important. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, um, we were talking just a little bit ago about like, um, what different writing spaces are like for those of us who didn't um, know that we were writers when we were little, right? There's a friend of mine who's um, a famous writer and he knew he was a writer when he was in high school and I was like, that's nice <laughs> that you could do that. That's nice, we had to make money. So I have a whole other life, right? We have whole, we had yeah. whole other lives. We have whole other lives. We have so many other skills. So many of us who are working class, uh, queer or people of color are all three like yeah you just you there's lots of different things that we have to attend to and so that um, living just is what defines my work and and um, having been politicized in the early 90s when you know yet another wave of anti-immigrant immigration just hatred and violence you know um, shaped me um, it helped me see that there was a lineage I came from that was, uh, there were scholars that were artists, that were warriors, and my, that included my family, but it took me a long time to see that. So in my writing, you'll see a lot of things where I kind of admit, like, I, I was fully <clears throat> invested in respectability politics, and I even went to grad school. In my grad school essay, I was like, I'm going to write a memoir where... I'm gonna talk about how <laughs> we're like not just maids and la la la. And I was like, okay. So, okay, that's okay. I'm, I'm making fun of myself and probably, you know, don't feel away if that's you now. But um, I figured out through that time at UC Riverside that, that I was, uh, that gesture of like, I am more than X is the same gesture of you are not important, you are not human. But it just looks different when we're saying it, but it, feels the same because you, we're still trying to be better than some other mother, 
Yeah. I'm a refer, sorry, there's children. Some other fool, right? So, th so I figured out, like, oh, that's not, that's not what I want to do. So I'm always just trying to figure out how I can get ahead of myself in, in thought. And so I look to black thought a lot uh, for that, for, like, where, what I'm not seeing, what I haven't seen yet. Um, yeah, so I'm just always trying to not hurt myself or others and, yeah. and tell people who... I'm just gonna curse, sorry, Aura. I'm just gonna tell people who the fuck I am because if you wait too long, they'll right. tell you. And so you're just like, no, I'm just, I'm not yeah. gonna wait for you. I'm not waiting for you to tell me who I am, I know already. And I think that that's like a kind of power that as writers that we have, right? Like I tell people, I didn't come up in the traditional way that many writers do. I didn't, I dropped out of high school and never went back to any kind of education. So I was working retail jobs most of my life and Sharing my, I've been sharing my poetry online for about 17, 18 years. Um, on, I've been on everything. And, um, and it just so happened that Instagram was where I kind of, quote unquote, blew up. And so uh, Sandra Cisneros in an interview said a quote that I quote all the time that um, a news reporter asked her, like, what does it feel like to be an overnight success? And she said, that must be the longest night I've ever lived, right? <laughs> and so because my books are fairly new, I'm this, I'm a new voice, a new da 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 whatever. I'm like, nah, I've been doing this for all my life. Like, I was, set, I was in middle school writing poems about my dad's alcoholism, and like, I was writing since I was in elementary school. But like you said, if we don't tell our story, people will tell it for us. Yeah. And I'm just as much, as much an authority on what I do as anyone else that's gone to school and that has had all these things. But what did happen, and I looked at, was that I never had any institution trying to change my voice. I never had to consume uh, white writers if I didn't want to. You know, so I got to read who I wanted to read. I got to find myself. I used to go get lost in the library and in bookstores. And so I got to develop the voice that I want, wanted to develop. <coughs> Sorry. And I see like other, and I think a lot of these conversations and the questions are posed is for people who are constantly in spaces where they're being challenged for their voice, especially when you're in school. Like I go speak at these colleges and, and a lot of the young students ask me things. I'm like, I. I never had that problem because I was just writing poems online. And, and who's gonna tell you something? I mean, people will tell you a lot of things. But like, everybody's equal online. I don't see anybody's MFA online, you know? And, and, um, and so I think that that's um, part of, we were talking about uh, different canons. Yeah. And I guess for me, it's, the, it's, it's social media. And I also came up through slam. And in poetry, when you do spoken word, when you do slam, it's a competition and it's five judges at random in the audience. They don't know your background. They don't know what you've been doing. They're just hearing the one poem you're doing in front of them and whether that poem is good or not. So every poem you do has to be the best poem you've ever written if you want to win. And I've, I've won a few things. So, <laughs> so um, I learned how to write from that, you know, and, and, and those are the spaces that I occupied. But it's, it's really beautiful to see uh, women like you who went through the grit of it all to like, you know, and then to have to sell yourself to these institutions and like, you know, kind of almost, not sell yourself, but like, you're kind of like, you know, let me come to your school because this is what I'll do if I come here. And like, so hearing you talk about how you're like, no, I'm gonna write about something different, something you've never heard before. I feel that that's something that has to happen a lot, especially within students that are in grad school that are working on. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it becomes like, um, are there any other nerds in here? Nerds. nerds, right? So like, oh, I mean, you know, self-defined, so self self-defined. Yeah, me. for real. Come on, it's <laughs> Sunday. You could be outside. You're not high. Maybe you're high. You could be here. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, uh, yeah. It's fine. You could still be high. Um, we, um, we like books, we like to read, we like stories. Sometimes we're introverts, sometimes we're not. Um, and for me, I mean, I, write, I talk about this in my memoir, which is uh, in the world with my agent, God help her. Everybody send her good thoughts. <laughs> um, and how um, a lot of, some of us are predispositioned for behaving correctly and behaving the way the teacher wants us and some of us, our light skin helps us with us and somehow our femininity sometimes helps us with us and so there's, there are just ways where um, public education is so much about um, the value that Western knowledge gives to certain people fits in certain bodies better than others, right? And so I bought into that for most of my life because it was helping me survive and because I thought it was gonna get my family a bigger house. 
it kind of didn't work that way, right? But, um, but it helps you, it's a tool that you, but if you ingest it and you believe it for the rest of your life, it will harm you and it will harm other people. It just is a matter of when, right? And when you figure that out. So I got to, fi and, and I wrote that, le so personal statements, you write personal statements to get into shit, right? Okay, to everything, right? Cover letter, no se que madres. So I'm really good at that. I'm really good at being like, you need me for X, Y, and Z, and this, that, and the third. Like, you just do because your shit is boring. You need <laughs> us. Like, you're, it's over. It's a wrap. Like, what else you got, yeah. right? So, um, but I was still, you know, holding these really kind of, you know, harmful beliefs. And so you just kind of have to keep going and have some compassion for yourself. And I'm not that, this is going to something else, but I'm not that active online because I'm like, do not drag me because I don't do that shit. Like I do it, if we hang out together, I'll talk smack. But like online, I'm like, listen, yeah. I'm like very, I do danza. Like I believe in like, you take care of your energy. You like take care, you know, I'm wearing a lot of red on purpose. And this is not like an accident, right? Like I get limpias regularly, right? Like energy to me is everywhere. And I try to be really careful with what I put out. But um, how is that related to getting into grad school? It just is. Because when you show yeah. up, you're like, you're not going to recolonize me. You're not going to recolonize me. And I had, <laughs> where's my book? In my notebook, this is the wrong one, but I had like a picture of Audre Lorde in here, right? And so every time I would sit in class, I would like open it up and I'd look at her and we'd make eye contact and I'd be like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> We're good. But I was like in my mid-30s right. and I, I had a whole other life and I was like, I'm here to work with Juan Felipe, to work with Mike Davis, Stephanie Hammer, Michael Jaime. I was Beautiful. Like, I'm, I'm, not I'm not coming. I only applied to one grad school because I didn't want to go anywhere else. I was like, I'm staying in California. I learned my lesson. <laughs> I went to school on the East Coast. I was like, I'm not doing that again. Um, anyway, there's just a lot of things that you, that we take with us, and that's what we're trying to say. Yeah, you brought up uh, Mike Davis and the other writers, and so like, well, one of the things that we're going to talk about was who we were in, um, like, who are we in conversations with, right? Yeah. Um, You're such a good facilitator. Thank you. I, you know. <laughs> Dale. I'd be, who I, are you talking to? Who, who are you in conversation I mean, with? I, other than me right now. <laughs> well, I mean, you. And um, it's, it's I, I think right now is a really exciting time for literature, right? Um, yeah. Especially because we have so much control over what we do. Look at, like, this festival. It's all mostly small presses. I think well, it's all small presses. And... Um, I'm in conversations with, um, like, you know, you have the, the spoken word uh, 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 legends, you know, like Sekou, uh, Shihan Van Cleef, Thea Monier, all of these people that pioneered spoken word in a large way are people that I came up under because the poetry lounge is where I started performing and doing performance poetry. But then I also have a lot of my peers, like Elizabeth Acevedo, who's fucking killing the game. Um, you know, I have um, Safia El Hilo is a, Friend, a dear friend of mine who also I had the honor of her editing my manuscript, you know, and, and like my one of my favorite poets edited my manuscript. Warson Shire is someone who, um, since we were on Blogspot, we, you know, right now she, she wrote for Beyonce and she disappeared. God bless her, I love her. I would disappear too if I wrote for Beyonce. I'd be like on a mountain somewhere, catching, catching in my lemonade oh, coins. No. But, but I'm, I like, there's so many people that are doing such huge, amazing things for uh, my dear friend Rudy Francisco has been on the on the Jimmy Fallon show two night like two times already on late night TV and so to see poetry going into these places that like we as children didn't think like we just thought it was like these stuffy books that we would pick up you know like all I knew and and even then like I didn't know how dope Maya Angelou was like I just picked up her book in a library store and then later like I was watching Poetic Justice and like her poem is in the beginning and I was just like what Tupac Numat you know like what you know and like all these things that change that we don't understand that these are all people that are living and breathing and existing around us and I have a really cool story talking about certain cool full circle moments um Sandra Cisneros who's my fairy godmother and I've never had the honor of meeting well I've had the honor of meeting her but I've never had the honor of having a conversation with her um because every time I see her I'm like uh, 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 like I don't know um but she was in town to for 
uh, a house of my own, right? And she was doing a reading at the Central Library, and I didn't get tickets, so I had to wait and stand by. I freaking made it in with my friend. Like, we were like, we're not leaving until they let us in. And I'm sitting in the audience, and she's talking, and the Q&A opens up, and, and uh, Luis Rodriguez is in the audience, and um, he says something to her, and there were these other writers that are were part of their cohort, you know, like, they're their time and I forgot the name of like the other people that were there and they were talking they just started having a conversation about amongst themselves about their time in Chicago in their writing program right and I remember sitting there thinking like I want this I want this one day for me like I want to be where Sandra is and I want another young girl to be in the audience wanting this and um my third book release is going to be at the Central Library yeah. in the same place where Sandra Sandra happened so the fact that Thank you. But these are also people that I look up to, like I, Luis, like I read his work in, in, in high school, you know, and, and um, to, to be able to have him at the Achuchas and somebody that I could go to and be like, how do I do this? Can you help me? And for him to give knowledge generously is such an amazing, beautiful thing. And I think in LA we're spoiled rotten. Yeah, like, and yeah. I think we're, uh, you, um, it just depends on what part of LA you're hanging out in, because I don't know where you all hang out, but where I hang out, like I try to only be around people who are kind and who are generous and who are not full of themselves. And so, like, I don't, I know that there are pockets in LA where that's maybe not the case, but I don't know. I've never known that place. I'm not gonna go hang out there anyway. So, um, and I just, I wear like all my feelings on my face, so it's like really hard for me to hide otherwise. But. Um, yeah, I mean, I went, so I waited a long time. So I had a whole life in like public policy and like economic development. So for anybody who like has another life and you're like, what do I do with my life? Well, there's lots of things, but, um, and so I was in my thirties and I had like a, a little writing life in the Bay Area in Oakland and San Francisco. I was a big Vona head. I went many, many times. I got to, I got to study with Cherie Moraga through Vona. Lorna de Cervantes lived on 24th Street at the time. Um, Aya de Leon was there. She was my first workshop ever. I mean, it was, I was like, I'm good. I worked with my heroes. Like, what else you got? Uh, you know, so when you get to have the privilege of working with people who are generous and good teachers, because not just because you're a writer doesn't mean you're a good teacher, because that doesn't happen. Um, I'll just leave that there. But, you know, um, then you're like, well, this is possible. It is possible to be mentored and supported in this way and to be challenged, right? Because if you take a class with Chidi Moraga, she's like not going to be, she goes right into, she sees the wound and she puts her finger in it. She's like, you have to make this more beautiful. We don't have time to cry about it. And I'm just like, I, I get it. I, I hear you and let's go, right? But that's not, people's responses can be different to that. But in terms of like who am I um, conversing with, I made a little list. It's incomplete, but um You're such a Virgo like I show up at places I'm like I don't know ask me a question we'll see what I'm feeling and then she's just like I have she's like she came up to me and she goes I have a Virgin May I brought these things for us is it okay if I put them out and I was just like girl do you because I show up with so many feelings I can't even think of everything yeah. else but this yeah. is how I cope with my feelings by but like I'm sorry I interrupted you no you're good you're good As the, so um Dana Johnson Really beautiful fiction writer. I hope I'm talking with her. Um, so I, beyond poetry, writing, right? So we're writers. We write stories. We write a lot of different kinds of, uh, in very uh, many different genres. So yeah, Dana Johnson. I hope I'm talking to Shaki Jackson. She's amazing. Doug Brown, Muriel Young, Michael Jaime Becerra, Bridget Bianca, who's right there. You, Marisa La Norte, Natasha Trethaway, I hope. Rosa Alcala, Vanessa Vanji Mateo, Seshu Foster, Elena Maria Viramontes, Peter J. Harris, so many more. My partner, Kenji Lu, who reads my stuff. Sometimes I'll read him something and he'll be like, I remember this one line. I'm like, damn, he didn't like any of the rest. Okay. <laughs> um, and then artwork, right? So I mentioned Vanessa Vanji Mateo, who's a drag queen, right? And um, I'm in the part of my life where like, I think that people on TV are my friends. Like, I think that people <laughs> from Schitt's Creek are my friends. I think that the drag, the drag queens are my friends, not all of them, some of them are mean, the ones who are not. <laughs> so it's like this, um, I'm having like an interesting conversation in my life and in my head and in my writing with them. Um, because you, at some point you're gonna get sick of writing about your dad 
or crying yeah. about your mom. You're like, all Definitely. right, that's enough. Um, so yeah, so I wrote like in this new book, I wrote Vanessa Benji Mateo a love letter because Beautiful. she. So if you saw the, the reunion for RuPaul's Drag Race, yeah. you saw how she said that she. So she was dating one of the drag queens on there, who I don't think is necessarily like good for her, frankly. <laughs> but um, so so the whole you're invested. Is, the, I'm really invested in that and her Benji's feelings because you could see them on her face. I was like. Oh, so she wanted a romance like The Notebook, but she was getting a post-it, and I was like, oh, I got you. <laughs> I got you, Vanjie, so I wrote her a, a, oh, lo that's a so love beautiful. letter. Yeah. So anyway, but there's I mean, yeah. different people that we talk to in, in our writing and in our heads. And yeah. Said, Todo vale. Speaking of people that are not, um, I mean, I forgot Yosimar Reyes, also as another writer who, if you don't know Yosimar, you need to. Yosimar is fantastic. He's such a fresh uh, breath of air. Um, but also like Sancha, the musician, uh, Sancha and I recently were at an event together and just sitting and talking about her process and like, she's like um, very, uh, she's does, her music isn't punk, is a mixture of things, but she's very much in the punk world and that's not a world I've ever ventured into. So talking to people that do different things, Francisca Valenzuela, who's um, a singer from South America and she, my friend JP Sachs, who's like um, a musician and writes love songs, like we'll sit in his car and play like, favorite love songs to each other and listen to the lyrics because I all I do is write about love and um but I think it's so beautiful to have so many different artistry around and there's people that I'm in conversations with that don't know I'm in conversation with them and I'm just hella invested in their lives and whatever they're doing and um do you have any other questions that you want to answer do you want to open up for to the to them yeah so we're gonna, if y'all have questions, and this is the part where you don't stare at us with blank faces, please, because afterwards you wanna come up and ask us things and then it gets weird, and this is your time to ask, because we're here. So yes, any questions? I, I'm telling you, and then later you're gonna have all the questions. Yay, there's yes, a question, okay. yay. I can always count on my girls. <laughs> Hi, so my question is, I think, from my experience and just from observing, I think when it comes to writers of color, they're often X to like tap into trauma, um, whether it's like their own trauma or like trauma of like their ancestors and foremothers and forefathers and all that good stuff. So I was wondering, um, how do you as writers, how do you tap into, not tap into, but how do you share the joy? Like how do you subvert those requests? Like I don't want to talk about my trauma for your enjoyment. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about this joy I experienced. How do you tap into that joy and how do you share it? I think, uh, I mean, I write a lot from trauma. Like, I mean, I said that in my poem. I write my poems to, to survive, right? But there's also, I, I do other work. Like, I have a column where I write about my dating and relationships and things like that. And, and I think that's where I tap into my joy because I get to, like, tell people stories that aren't necessarily, like, that heavy, you know? And, and, and I get to tell people that I'm someone that dates and hooks up and is hella messy and sometimes is juggling a situationship and a potential and all these, and then they catch me talking shit about them on Instagram, it's a mess. <laughs> but like, but these are things that I feel some, I, some of us, even myself in the beginning, I was shy from for, for fear of not being taken seriously as a writer. And I'm like, no, like this is part of my story. I am a modern writer, right, for whatever it means. So that means that social media, that means that dating, Tinder, these apps are all part of my life. All of these things are really, present in my life and they're part of the joy in my life you know like I love falling in love I just don't last in it very long but I love falling, falling in love I love the chase I love all of that so I write about that and I also write about my niece and nephew so much because they are my joy and um and I think it's about being unapologetic with your joy too you know like um, I always feared that I would be an Adele and if I wrote happy poems people wouldn't want to read them and now I'm just like fuck it I'm happy like, I'm in love for right now. I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, but you're gonna get this love poem. And um, yeah, how do you? That's very Buddhist of you. I am in love right now. Yeah. That's good. Things get, you know, things get wild. So we're, we're, me and my on and off again partner, we're both cancers, so it's just, oh, wow. it's a lot. So today we're good. Yeah, <laughs> so previews and coming attractions, like I, um, my, my, Life partner is a Pisces and I'm a Virgo and yeah and at first I was like what how are we gonna do this I was like, I don't know. but there's too much I have too much fire 
and he's watery and he like t he shows me how to chill out and I'm like, oh, so not every choice is important. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. um, how do we write joy? So I think your question is really interesting. I think it points to two different things. One of them is like, how do we, what makes me think of is this line in one of the poems that I wrote for this next book where I say, I take and keep my flesh. I take and keep my body. This, all of these traumatic things have happened, will happen, might have happened. I get to keep me, I keep my desire, I keep my body, I keep my joy, right? Um, no one's asked me to write about my trauma in a class or to perform. Like, um, I think that, that uh, there, in, that, in the playing field of that question, there's what gets attention from academic and literary organizations is a lot of suffering, right? So we see a lot of, you know, undocu poets get a lot of attention right now because a lot of these are white liberal establishments or at least upper middle class establishments and they feel guilty and they're like, oh, wh what can we do? What can we give you? Which is fine. That's a, that's a right reaction. And there's lots of different reactions to have. Um, but I, I don't necessarily see that as like I'm performing my suffering for you. But there's so many, that's so layered. It's so layered, right? Like, um, I think you should just write what is coming out. Write what stories you need to say, and you, then that's just, that's just what that is. Um, but yeah, I think for a lot of us, um, some of us wonder like, oh, could, do I have happy poems? And I literally had to sit down and count them in this one. I was like, let me see. Okay, mm, George Michael, nope, gonna cry there. Like, it's just, you know. Um, and how maybe things are both, right? There's one of these poems where um, I'm talking about um, eating these really beautiful Chinese, they look like um, flat empanadas are about the size of my hand, and they're like the most delicious, beautiful things ever. And I was thinking about like who made them, whose hands made them, and like, um, and then I'm, and then I start thinking about like, well, um, um, you know, children who are or who are caged right now, and was I ever caged? And, and, and there's like it's just a thought process about like the one time I got caught with tater tots in third grade and like the senora, the lunch lady was like, no, you get to stay here, right? And like what that felt like and how like pathetic that that's my experience of like what that, but what does it mean that we listen to adults who, who don't know any better who are just doing their jobs, right? So it's like this poem is trying to do both things at once. It's like I'm trying to see that it is not all suffering and but it is also right so yeah but sometimes many times as at least i can speak for myself we can't get to the joy without the poem like i haven't been able to process some things until i write about them and like i've written to like exhaustion about my father and his death or whatever and now on the other side i found joy in telling these stories about this man who was who was very complicated in my life and who gave me my love for literature and gave me my love for like um a work, my work ethic, like I, I work, and it's because my father instilled that in me. And he's also somebody that hurt me a lot. So anything that I write is gonna be that double-edged sword. But the joy that I have, that I have this man to write about, and that I have the strength to write about this, and that is also a joy, you know? And, and, and the beautiful thing about being a poet that tours and gets to do stuff, I get to tell the funny stories in between the poems. So if you get to hear me, you hear the stories that led to the poems and it gives the poems more texture and it gives it a sweet release. And I think that that's a beautiful thing that we get to do with our work, that we get to heal, like we write the poems to survive. And then once we've survived, we get to go around and be like, yo, here's a fucking book about the time that I thought shit was fucked up, but it wasn't. So come over here and let's party that like I'm good and you're good and we're all good. And where we, take forever with one question. So another question, please. The last thing I would say about that is that there are also a lot of sex poems in here. And if Ooh. you know anything about me, I'm very private. But when I write, I'm like, well, I get to be free. I get to be free when I write because, yes. yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Yay. Hey, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being here. It was my first here. time in the arts district. <laughs> It was a little scary. Slash little Tokyo <laughs> slash Tongva. I slash. survived. <laughs> um, so you've had great success, both of you. Um, but what needs to change in literary LA? What? How does literary LA need to change, or does it need to change? Is it? Is it? Um, 
exhibiting the voices that represent the diversity of Los Angeles? Do you have an answer for that? I, I have lots of different answers for that one. I think that one of the, the things that I was excited about, so I lived in the Bay Area for many years, like that's where I became a writer and was really just like held as a writer, right? Um, and it's, the Bay Area is smaller. I didn't have a car for 12 years, so it's a very opposite kind of physical culture and literally the buildings are different. Everything's different, the, the weather. And so I could, I wrote a lot about home when I was there and there, so what I want to challenge is that there is a single literary community. There is not. There never will be. There never was. Nobody owns art. So no. Um, and coming up in the Bay Area, I got to see that because the, the people that I was working with and studying with were um, uh, writing about their lives. But they were queer folks. They were working class. And so that my canon is Lorna de Cervantes, who writes about freeways. My canon is... Uh, Pat Parker and Audre Lorde and Angela Davis and um, Yuri Kochiyama and so that my canon is 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 bigger than just you know Whitman. I read Whitman too. There's so much more, right? There's always so much more, and so any field is always going to be myopic because it just sees itself. But that's any field: lawyers, medicine. Everybody's just like, oh, race and class have nothing to do with me. And you're like, yeah, it does. It has to do with everything. With this building, who built it, what land are we on? It's everywhere, and so. A lot of us don't have a choice but to see it all. And so, you know, everybody else's work is you get to go figure out how to see the things you're not seeing. And that's the, your life's work and mucha suerte, right? So um, uh, there's this thing that happens where, for instance, like, you know, Jessica didn't, didn't come from like that kind of quote unquote literary world, but neither did I. I came through like the people of color, working class. We had to make our own workshops because there is a history of dismissal of the content of a lot of our writing. I know, you know, prominent white poets who are, you know, who are like, oh, people of color write about food a lot. And I'm like, yeah, you do too, fool. What about the wheelbarrow? Isn't there like a chicken in there? You write about food too. Like, relax. Like, this is, these are the mundane things that are I'm important. sorry your food is so bland. You can't write about <laughs> yeah. it, but whatever. But it's a lie. It's a lie that, that white people don't write about food. It's like, oh, come on, girl. You, everybody writes about everything, but your perception in whiteness is trying to categorize this content that you can't relate to and so you slot it gets slotted and not literary right but that's not but that's false so every time we think that that there's like some literary world that needs to change then we have to do it that's not my job we're here to tell our stories catch up and they they're catching up sometimes sometimes they're not but you know when for instance, like folks like Jessica who are, have such a huge following because she's saying things that need to be said, then you know, um, established, um, exclusive uh, literary organizations are like, oh well, let's bring Jessica. That's good. So then, they, but that's that's their work of figuring out what the fuck is going on and catching up. So like, let them do their work, mm -hmm. and let them find out who we are. And we've always been here. We're going to be here. And. Um, and then we just have to bring people with us, right? So we can't do this exactly. on our own. Yeah. So like the thing, so now, so our job is to bring everybody else with us. And so like give everybody else our jobs that we couldn't have. Like literally what it means to redistribute resources is give someone else your job that you don't need to have because you can get another one, right? People have literally given me jobs and that's how I've gotten to where I am, right? So like, that's what it means. Like you don't need this building. Um, that space over here in the little atrium, I was like, oh good, they're actually housing people. I was like, yes, psych, it's an art installation. But you could, right? So like do the other thing, do the thing we need to do and it's not the thing that's a liability, the thing that's like we have to take risks and, and that's I think how we change things. I uh, talk a lot about how things need to change. Um, I don't have an interest of fitting into an existing institution. That's not for me. I've never been part of an institution. I don't care for it. I don't care to climb the mountain. I care to teach the mountain to get on its knees and come to me. And that's how I treat, and that is how I treat all of this. You want me to come, oh, you want me to come to your thing? Well, it's gonna have to be under my terms or whatever, because I understand that at this moment, I have a lot of attention on me and it, I have the power to teach you how to house a poet like me when I come to your event. And if I come to your event and I don't like it, I'm gonna tell you that my, read, for me, my readers who I call my mangoes are sacred for me. And if they are not welcomed in a space and if they're in a space that's not gonna create content for them, I don't wanna be there. I don't wanna be there. And I've turned down, I remember, um, 
I was invited to do something in Echo Park uh, two years ago, and I looked at the lineup, and everybody, all the poets were white, which is, I don't have anything against white writers, but I don't want to be in a lineup where it's all writers, and I'm the only person of color, and it's in a place, it's in my community that was gentrified, and it was this place, and you have no interest of placing anybody else that is also from the community within this lineup of poets. And so now here I am as the voice for everybody, and I don't have an interest in being the only voice for everybody all the time, because I can't talk for everybody. I could only tell my story and the best of my ability, and if people connect with it, they connect with it, right? And so um, Chingona Fire was that. Um, if we're in a, in a hiatus right now because I can't keep up with everything that I'm doing, but Chingona Fire was an open mic that was put together by me and my Chicana partner and, and Angela Aguirre, and we were curate um, spoken word of open mics for women of color ran by women of color. So only women of color put it on, and we only had women of color feature. All women were welcome to come and sign up in the mic, but women and femmes of color got preference on the mic. So um, it was never a problem because people knew their, like, if women run a, pro, a, a space, people know where they fall in the space and they respect it. And like, I've just learned that. And, um, and so that's what I'm doing, like, that's what I feel the change the change is happening because we're all the change and it's how we show up and, and how we demand and those of us that have the visibility, we get to, to, we get to, I could ask for stuff and people would be like, okay, and they don't even think about it. But I know that if somebody that didn't have the, that isn't as known as I am, asked for something, they're not gonna get it. And so it's my job to show up um, and with integrity every time I do and not just say yes because I can. I've turned down things when I get invited to host, like I got invited to host a queer event. I'm not queer. I'm an ally, so it's my job to sit in the audience and shut up. So I tell people I can't host for you, but I'll come, I'll sit in the audience, I'll share it on my social media, and here's someone that you could book to do this job and that I think is important. And like, I like passing jobs along to other people. I'm like, oh, I can't. You know, I think a black woman is better for this event than I am. Like, I'm not gonna come and perform on, in February at an event when you could have booked a black woman. Well, you should book them all times, but you know, but if it's, you know, this, and then like, I remember I got uh, invited to do something at the Pan Pacific, like it's the um, film festival. And I was just like, that's a black film festival. Why are you trying to bring me out? And they're like, it's okay. I'm like, no, it's not okay. And here are the voice, here are like, other black women that you can book and because they would do the same for me. They wouldn't take up that space. And, and I think that that's, um, that's really important for all, all of us to do. So think, like, I think y'all showing up and supporting two Latinas in poetry is really important. I know that we're running out of time. It's five, but you know, do we have, are we? I mean, we can keep going. That's the wrong thing to workshop. tell me. Workshop, we're gonna workshop. Get so like, well, you know out. what happened yesterday? We'll take one more question. <laughs> right here. Hi, okay. So I know how both of you both mentioned that when you write, like you write what's real, you know, like you write your pain, you write your love, you write your sex, you write what you wanna write, right? Right, <laughs> get it? But I, I like to write poetry and I it's like a healing type thing for me. So whether it's like a, like a, a bad hookup or it's like a bad day or whatever, like I like to write about it. So there's times where I catch my family asking to read things that I write. And of course it's like an awkward situation if it's about sex, you know, cause I don't want my mom to see what I'm doing. Obviously that's kind of weird. But I have a question for both of you and at what point in your lives were you like, fuck it. Like I'm just gonna let people read what I write because this is me. Like, how did you get that courage? And at one point were you like, you know what? Like, I'm sorry, but this is who I am. Uh, I don't know if I was, haven't had a filter. I grew up in, I grew up really, in, I was gonna be a nun, it's weird. But um, don't, I, was, I wanted to be a nun when I was 14, it didn't work out. Then I had a boyfriend and I was like, oh, I like this. Um, but I grew up like telling my testimony in youth group and like, talking in front of people. So I've always been very like, this is my whole life and like I'm transparent because Jesus, I don't know. But um, so when it came to poetry, uh, I, I got a lot of backlash from my sisters um, because they were like, why are you telling everybody our business? Why are you telling everybody about our dad? Because a lot of my work in my youth was about my dad being an alcoholic. And so then I just stopped sharing. I wasn't hiding it, but I wasn't showing it 
to people and I was used to my family not being interested. And when you're bilingual, you have kind of like a built-in protection because they can't read in English. So like you're like you writing some wild shit and like they don't know. And um, but now my stuff gets translated and so then my mom or my mom will be like, translate that for me and my sisters will and I'm like, why did you translate that poem about it? Like the guy rubbing my belly during set, you know, and all these things. But um, I think, I think we're all human and we forget that our parents are human too. And we also forget that our stories aren't only ours, that they're living them too. And when they, and we, and when we stop doing this with our work and you're like, oh look mom, I wrote this poem about you and my tias and let me translate it to you. She might be quiet, but there's this honor that they feel with the fact that their story gets to be told on such a large, like in such a way that they never even thought their story was worthy of being told, you know? And, and now like, my mom doesn't really ask me for my work, but every now and then I'd be like, oh mom, like in Tesoro, like I wrote all these things about you and like I sat and I talked to her and she was like really quiet and I thought she dismissed it and I didn't care for it. And I even wrote, read her a poem about that I wrote about her being assaulted and me being assaulted. And it was the first time I talked about my assault aloud to her. And she didn't say anything. And then my cousin came over another day and they all had a whole conversation with me not being in the room. And it was all about how proud they are. And so sometimes our parents don't know how to have the conversations also, because they're uncomfortable, but we, I think we do a disservice when we assume that it's not to have with them. And, if we're, and if, what's the point of we're telling everybody all these stories if the people closest to the stories don't also get to share them? And so that's how I treat my work, so yeah. I'm a big chicken shit, so uh, my brothers know what I'm writing. Um, I don't know if my dad does. He does read in English, but I, he's not invited to the party for so many reasons. Um, and then um, they, um, in my brain, I'm writing bilingually, but I'm not necessarily on the page. And so there are poems that I will read and that my mom will be like, mija, that's wrong. Can you fix that? in your book. And I'm like, no, it's kind of already in there. Uh, so, um, so yeah, but I mean, in the, with the memoir, I'm going to have to have, uh, you know, conversations with my mom um, about what's in there because there is a lot of um, detailed um, abuse that, um, well, so I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, ¿Cómo se llama? Ed Lynn wrote Waylaid, right? Who's read Waylaid? Oh, go read it. Go read it. Go read Edlin's Waylaid. His family had a no-tell motel on the Jersey Shore, and he wrote a book all about it, and it is as nasty as you're thinking it is right now. It is gross. And his family was like, why did you say this? And he's like, if you didn't want me to say what you did, you shouldn't have done it. And I was like, yes! Okay, so there you go. Like, I'm not making anything up. Like, it's just what's true. I'm trying to figure out what is true because I'm trying to understand it. And because there are other girls like me, there's other working class kids like me, and we need to figure out what the hell's going on and how we're going to survive this. So, you know, I'll have to have that conversation with my mom, and yeah. because it's also her story, but it's also mine. So there is a. So my out has been like, this is how I experienced your relationship, parents, and it is fucked up and but it's also beautiful and this is what I got from it so that's that's that and also there's some things from that are just in your journal that's not for sharing but also I'm like mom I'm 30 I have sex like it's fine yeah it's fine like you know and then I, yeah. I like I've gotten to the point where I asked my mom do you regret not having more lovers because she only had my dad and she's like I do I'm like no mom let's talk let's talk about it like because I gotta make up for what you didn't do so like like let's talk, let's have it's these real. conversations because I need to know how much catching up I need to do. Yeah, come on, and, sis. We um, know you have you have needs. Everyone has <laughs> needs. Come on, you mom. know. But yeah. but it's it's this thing where now she'll kind of like have tongue in cheek conversations with me after I like try to push that door down so many times. You know, like at first it was just like you're so gross, like storm out of the room, and then now she'll be like. So what were you talking to your boyfriend? Is that why you didn't come home? You know, like, and like, try to, try to catch me during like my walk of shame or whatever. <laughs> and then I'd be like, mom, I don't have my bra on. So like, I don't know if you know what's happening right now. So let's talk about it. Or you could read about it in Suelta, here it is. <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, um, I found the most joy when the people that I write about have also taken 
investment in what I write because it just makes it that much more beautiful. Like when my cousins would be like, oh, I read this poem and it would be like, nobody else is gonna connect with it like you will because like nobody knows how fucking crazy our fucking family is. So when I'm talking about it, like you kind of get it, but if my cousin says, hey, I read the poem and it was really good, I'd be like, okay, like this is good. Like I got your validation and I'm doing something right. Those are the, those are the worst critics, your, your siblings and your cousins. And um, so when they're buying my book and giving it to their friends, I'm like, oh, you're giving me permission? Wait till I tell everybody about what you did. And um, that's why nobody tells me the cheese miss, but, uh, but this has been so beautiful and I think we'll, yeah. we'll wrap up. Yeah, so unless that, there's any one more burning question. If anybody has like a question that you have to like, no? Okay. I know people are like lingering in the back and coming back. <laughs> I feel oh like God. you're like, I don't know what's gonna happen back there. Like, Lord. I, I appreciate know. Introverts, you. the introverts are yeah. back there. So um, we, I have, books at the Not Occult table, which I'm gonna run to, and you can meet me there, and I'll, if you have your own books, I'll sign them. I know uh, you I have- I brought books, yeah. I brought yes. books and little chat books and stickers to sell. Yes. And so she'll be here. <laughs> and so then, um, thank you so much for coming yes, up. Thank, thank you. you, Russell. Thanks, Russell. Thank Kyle, Larb, yeah. this, lit, lit. this has been the chillest, Yay. the chillest thing I've ever been a part of. Yeah. Yeah, like, so well organized. Nobody was bombarding her. They sent me the questions and I was like, surprise me. I know. And then Vicky, Vicky did, gave notes because she's a Virgo. But I was just like, surprise True. me. And I'll teach show her. up. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, and Vicky, I'm such a fan of your work. Oh my God, and, igualmente. And thank Yay. you so much. Yay. And um, like, yeah, we're out here. You know, living, yeah, writing, living, talking about our LA and, right. and our experiences. And so hopefully if y'all are writers, we get to sit on panels with you in the future. Yes. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.